guys, we're in a brand new sermon series starting today, starting today on the, um, the subject of questions. And what we are doing, we will be uh, asking some questions, asking some questions that all of us have probably asked sometime in our journey, our walk with God. And, and maybe you're here today, you're, you're watching today, and you, you, you've never given your heart to Christ. You're not a Christ follower today. You're just here. Somebody invited you, and you're kind of seeking what God has for you. But even you, all of us, no matter if you're saved or you're not saved, all of us ask these questions. God, what's your will for my life? God, why do bad things happen to good people? Hello, y'all with me? So we're going to deal with these kind of questions. And as a matter of fact, today, today we're going to ask that very first question. How can I know God's will? Does God have a will for my life? Is there something that God wants me, Oh, little old me? Is there something God wants me to do? Is there somebody that God wants me to marry? All right, all right. Is there, is there, is there a career path that God really wants? wants for me, or is this just stuff that I have to figure out by myself? No, no, no. God does have a plan for your life. God has a purpose, and God has a sweet spot. It's called His perfect will. Not His permissive will, but His perfect will, and I want to talk to you about that today. The last thing that you and I want as Christ followers is to be out of God's will. We don't want that. We want to be in that in God's perfect will for our lives, because, because when we're in the, the perfect will of God... We're in that place where favor rests. We're in the perfect center of God's will. I'm not talking about out in the suburbs. I'm talking about downtown, baby. I'm talking about in the perfect, sweet spot of the will of God. Now, I'm not talking about a street off. I'm not talking about an interstate off. I'm talking about the perfect, sweet spot of God's will. When we find ourselves there, we are where favor rests and blessings rest and the miracles of God flow. That's where I want to be. And so we're going to talk about that, that today. God is not hiding his will from us. Sometimes we think, well, you know, you know, God's will is really hard to find. Well, I, I don't think that's true. I think that God has a purpose and a plan and a will for us, and he shows it to us. And we're going to show you how to find it today. You know, I've preached on this subject over the last 30 years. I'm, I've been in ministry. I've been preaching over 30 years. And, and I've preached on knowing the will of God multiple times in my life. Most of the times I have come from uh, two or three different passages, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, which is acceptable to God. And it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is that perfect will of God. I've also gone to my life verse, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 6. By the way, if you don't have a life verse, that's a good one to have. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. He will show you his will. But I've never, ever, ever, ever preached on the will of God from Ephesians chapter 5. But I'm going to do it today and I'm going to highlight, really we're going to read and we're going to look at verses 8 through 17, but I want us to just key in real quick in way of introduction, verse 10 and verse 17. Look what the Bible says in verse 10. This is Paul speaking to the church at Ephesus, and Paul is saying to the church at Ephesus, he said, find out what pleases the Lord. Find out what pleases the Lord. What does God want for my life? Find out what pleases the Lord. Look at verse 17. And then he says, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is is understand what the Lord's will is. Listen to me, friend. God wants the best for you. I'm going to say that one more time until it sinks in, all right? God wants the very, very best for you. And so I think that we uh, have to challenge ourselves to believe that. Matter of fact, I think that's why God sent me this message to share with you today is because oftentimes we settle. We settle for second best and third best and fourth best and we don't think we deserve something and so we settle. But God says, no, 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 I don't want you to settle. I don't want you to settle. I don't want you to just marry somebody because you've got to marry somebody. I want you to find God's man for you. I want you to find God's woman for you. I w Amen. Amen. Somebody said, amen, if you're dating, I need to hear from you, amen? 
So, so I, I, want, I want the very best God has for me. So how do we do that? I want to give you three things that I want you to jot down today as we are walking through this passage of Scripture, all right? Three things. The first two things really pertain to your, your walk with God, your walk with God, okay? So we're going to get really personal in the first two points on how to discover God's will. But then the third thing, we're going to give you a list of eight different ways that you can find and discover God's will for your life. So this is going to be very, third point, very practical things, and I want you to write these all these things down. Number one, how do we find God's will for our life? Number one, somebody say number one. Number one, walk in the light. Somebody say that with me. Walk in the light. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Look in verses eight and nine. The Bible says, for you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Once again, for you were once, once darkness. You were once in darkness, but now you are in the light of the Lord. Walk in the light. Once you're in darkness, you made terrible decisions. You were headed towards hell, but then all of a sudden... The power of God entered your life. Come on, help me out from last week. All of a sudden, the paddles of the Holy Spirit of God, you lay in dead in your sins, in your trespasses and sins. You're in the muck and the mire of your sin. And all of a sudden, the power of the Spirit of God came along and... Ah, yeah, I love it. This is my charismatic service. I can tell already. Bam! There you are. Man, all of a sudden you come alive in Jesus Christ and you have moved from darkness to light. Say it with me. You've moved from darkness to light. Now, what does it mean to walk in the light? What is he saying? Once you're in darkness, now he's saying walk like you're in the light. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, here's the deal. We need to quit living like we are still in darkness. If you're a child of God, you are living in the light. You are, you are born again. You have been revived. You've been renewed. You are born afresh and anew from God. And God's saying, look, I want you to live like you've been brought back to life. Quit flirting and easing back towards the old life. Stop easing back towards darkness. Walk in the light. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. We got church people with light, but still living like they're in the dark. In other words, we're not doing what God's word says. We know what to do. We're just not doing it. If you want to know God's will, Child of God, listen to me. If you want to know God's will, we got to quit living in darkness. Take the truth that we know and obey the truth of the word of God. What does it say in verse 9? When you walk in their darkness, you will not understand goodness. You will not know righteousness. You will not know truth. But if you walk in the light, you will know goodness. You will know righteousness. And you will know truth. Week after week. I take what I do very seriously. I spend a lot of hours every week preparing a message to share with you. Now, guys, listen, I know we like to have fun in church. And I think if you can't have joy in the house of God, man, you ought to find a place where you can have joy. Amen? I mean, I just think that, that church is a place, yes, we're going to be reverent before a holy God, but also we can have enjoy each other. We can enjoy the presence of God. We can have fun, and it can be high energy and exciting, and the preacher ought to get excited. If the preacher can't get excited, how's anybody else going to get excited about the things of God? I thank God for, for what we get to experience here week after week after week. But I want to tell you, what we do here is more than just hype. What we do here is more than just screaming and hollering and hacking. Y'all ever known a pastor, a preacher? You ever heard one of them preachers? Oh, God is good. Hey. God will deliver you from the day of evil. Hey. 
I'm not making fun. I'm just saying that we're, God has called us to, to more than just hype. We're not just screaming and hollering and hooping and yelling. And although I, we do that a little bit. But our desire is to teach you the truths of the word of God. We're trying to teach the truths of God every single week. But listen to me. Listen to me. As we teach the word of God, you have to apply it. I, I can't apply it for you. So when we teach the word of God and give you biblical truth and biblical principles, week after week and give you handlebars on how to grab hold of the word of God and the things of God to change your marriage and to change your life and to change your career and to change your future and to change your children and how to raise your kids and the things of God. Listen, we give you these handlebars. It's your responsibility to grab hold of those things and apply them in your life. So church is not just about hype. It's not just about hollering and carrying on. But we're trying to teach the word of God. For example, it's a child of God. I'm talking to children of God now. It's a child of God. You know, you know good and well, you shouldn't be dating a non-Christian. But you do it anyway, and you expect God's blessings. When the Bible says not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We got Christians today that, are, that are, have experienced the light of God, but they kind of drift in back towards the darkness. We got Christians today that, that say, I know what the Word of God says. I've been taught it. I know. But you're still having sex outside of wedlock. Hello? You know it's not right. You know it, God's blessing's not going to be upon it. But you keep on doing it. You keep on drifting back. And every chance you get, you back all over that stuff. And you, you're having sex. You're having sex outside of wedlock. And you expect the blessings of God to fall upon you. You're a child of God, and you know you've been taught. You've been taught by the Word of God that, that you ought to give to the local church, and you ought to find the church that you believe in, whether it's Soul Quest or another church that's preaching the Word of God, and give and, and, and be generous towards that church so that church can continue to reach people far from God. But instead, no, 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 no. Instead, you say, no, I'm not going to do that. But instead, I'm going to give in to this temptation go buy that candy apple red Chevrolet Suburban. I'm going to have a house note for a car note. Come on, give me that $900 a month payment. What's wrong with you? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, you know, you know, you know you're supposed to be giving to the local church. But instead, you say, oh, I see that outfit over here. I got to have that outfit so I don't have the cash. I'll put that on my charge card that you pay 28.5% interest rate for. And you're wondering why your finances are in shambles. And you think if you come to the altar of God and say, God help, that all of a sudden you're, you're going to go home and there's going to be a $28,000 check in the mail. All I'm saying is, we try to teach the Word of God, but it's your responsibility. We're never going to know, listen to me, we're never going to know God's will for our life while we're walking as children of the light, walking in darkness. So number one, if we're going to know God's will for our lives, we've got to walk in the light. Walk in the light. Here's another problem. Here's another problem that so many church people have. So many want more revelation from God, but they haven't obeyed the revelation God's already given them. Well, I think I'm feeling called by God to leave soul quests and go to another church where I'm going to be fed better. First of all, if somebody says God, you need to go somewhere else. No, I'm just kidding. We don't talk like that around here. We just say God. Amen? God. Well, I'm just not, I'm not, I'm not getting enough. I need to go deeper. I want to go deeper. I want to go deeper. I want to go deep. I want to go deeper. You want to go deeper, but we haven't yet obeyed the Ten Commandments. How are 
we going to obey God? How are we going to experience God's will for our life and the best God has for us and His blessings and His favor and miracles in our life and wide open doors from the glory, from the, from the glory of God? How are we going to have all that if we won't even obey what God's already given us? So we can't be children of God who've experienced the light but are walking and drifting back towards the dark. So if you want to know God's will, number one, you got to walk in the light. Number two, number two, you got to, y'all going to love this. I think it'll probably get real quiet. Depends on, we're figuring out the personality of every service, but. Number two, if you want to know the will of God for your life, you got to cut out some. First of all, somebody say cut out. Cut out. Say cut out. Cut, out. cut it out. Cut it out. You know, like you have a cancer in your body, cut it out. Somebody say cut it out. So if you want to know the will of God, you have to cut out some people and some places. <laughs> All right, you're not convinced. Look at verse 11. Having nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Having nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention that, what the disobedient do in Secret. Cut out some people and places. Let me explain. I preached my whole ministry on reaching people far from God. For 30 years, I've been preaching reach people far from God. Reach people far from God. Get outside the four walls of the church and reach people far from God. Reach people far from God. I spent my whole ministry talking about restoring uh, relationships that are broken down. But the question is, is there ever a time to cut off a relationship? Is there ever a time, ever a time in your walk with God to cut off a relationship? And the answer is yes. Let me tell you when. You need to cut a relationship off if it is sinful, immoral, unethical, or unscriptural. You can't discover God's will for your life because you are running with people who are not encouraging you, not challenging you, and they're not leading you in the right direction. They're not leading you in a direction where you follow God more passionately. But instead, those people are leading you down a path that leads you, watch this, that leads you back to darkness. So there comes a time in our, in our Christian walk with God, we've got to decide, do we cut out some people and cut out some places? Listen, friend, you are either pulling them up or they're pulling you down. Now listen to me, you are either helping them move towards God or they are moving you away from God. Only you can answer that question. Only you can answer that question. You're not, you're not quite strong enough yet to hang out in the club and do what's right. Think about that. Oh, man, sometimes we get gung-ho. God saved us out of that, that lifestyle. And we want, man, I want to I jump back in there. I want to go back in there and share the gospel. Just be careful. Let me just say that it's much better for you to bring people that you want to see saved into your world than to go back into their world. Be careful. Just be careful. I'm not telling you can't do it. I'm just saying be careful because we're not the Apostle Paul yet. I mean, we're trying to grow in our faith, but I'm just saying be careful. Be careful because if, you don't, if you're not careful, what happens is, man, you go in with the right intentions. You're passionate about reaching people far from God, but you go back into that lifestyle, and before you know it, you start drifting yourself away from the light and back into the darkness. Maybe God saved you from a life of addiction and then you go back and you're around all that stuff that you were addicted to before. All I'm saying as your pastor is be careful. Because you got to grow in your own walk with God and mature in your own walk with God so that you can have what you need to bring people from that world into, our, into this world. As a matter of fact, bring them to Soul Quest Church. They they may think they're still in the club till they hear me preach. I'm just saying we got lights, you know. We got dark walls. We got loud music. Uh, we're breaking a dance on stage. It's a modest dance, though. 
I mean, we're having a big time in the house of God. And guess what? We can do all this. And tomorrow morning, we remember what we did. All right, let me move on because I stayed there way too long. I stayed there for maybe somebody in this house today. I don't know. Or, let me just say this, guys, 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 you are not anointed enough to go to a strip club and preach the gospel. Somebody say, no, that ain't you. Say, that ain't me. You're not anointed enough. Verse 11 and 12. Having nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what is disobedient and sacred, but rather expose them. What does that mean? You know, we live in a day today where we would rather hear a lie than to hear the truth. It's the day we live in. We have, this, we have to decide in 2020. This is, a, this is a year of decision for so many people. We have to decide in 2020 that we're going to stand for God's truth and possibly be hated for it, or we're going to compromise and be liked. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I'm going to preach the truth. Whether people like it or not, I'm going to preach the truth. That's what God's called me to do. So many churches have compromised the truth, and it breaks the heart of God. You may have to make a choice. You may have to make a choice. You, you, you want to choose God's best for your life, His perfect will for your life, or you want to choose certain people in places that, if you're not careful, will pull you back to the darkness. I don't want to take that chance. That's why I want to run with you people. That's why I want to run with Jason. Amen? That's why I want to run around with Janet and Josh and Don. I want to run with you people because you people are on fire for God. And when you're on fire for God, it, it just, that that flame, man, it just grabs hold of me, and I get a little on fire, too. And then when I'm on fire and I'm running with you, you get a little on fire. Listen, we need the church. That's why the church is essential. We are essential, body, soul, and spirit. We need to gather together. Amen? So we're talking about here, we're talking about cutting some, some things, some people, some places off. The third thing that I want to share with you today, and I'm going to close, is more practical. We talked about walking in the light. We talked about cutting off some stuff that's going to pull us back into the darkness. And if you do that, you're not going to know God's will. The third thing is I want you to understand how God leads. Look in verse 16 and 17. Understand how God leads. Verse 16 and 17, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Hello, amen, 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 amen. For the days of evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand. Somebody say, understand. But understand what the Lord's will is. How do we understand? That's the big $10 question. That's the theological question that everybody wants to know. How do I understand? How do I understand the will of God for my life? I really want to know. I've gone through this career and this career and this career and this career, and I can't seem to find my way. How do I know God's will for my life? I want you to jot these things down, okay? Get a pen out. If you are old school like me, get a pen out and write these things down. If you don't have a piece of paper, write it on somebody's arm next to you. If you got a phone, put it in your notes. Here they are. Number one, eight practical ways that God leads us to know his will. Number one, scripture, the word of God. Now, I know this sounds spiritual, but here's the, it is spiritual. The supernatural. we got to know the Word of God. Psalm 119, verses 105, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. A lamp to my feet so I don't stumble along the way and a light to my path so I can see where I'm headed. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know the mind of God for your life, 
If you want to know the, the will of God for your life, the first thing you got to do is commit your life to knowing the Word of God. Why? Because the Word of God is exactly that. It's the Word of God. But so often we are, we, and we've all done it. There's been times we've all done it. God, give me confirmation. Just write something in the sky with your finger. You can do it, God. And we sit around and we wait for God to write something in the sky. I'm not saying God won't move and God can't do that. God can give you a rainbow or God can't give you a shooting star to give you some kind of confirm. I don't know what, what that does, but I'm not saying God can't do that or won't do that. But I'm telling you, we need to stop wasting our time praying those kind of and asking those kind of things when we God's already said, listen, I've already spoken to you. It's called the Bible. Open up the book and read the book. You say, but preacher, I don't like to read. Or preacher, I can't read very good. Or preacher, I've got a, a, a D, I had ADD before everybody else. So did I. I can read something 14 times and I have to keep going back over the same paragraph. Anybody else like that? Yeah. We, got, we ended up okay, didn't we? Kind of, sort of. Go to, if, you got, if you know how to operate a phone, an iPhone, go to the app store and get the uh, Bible app. Just get the Bible app. You say, what's that? It's free. It's the Word of God. You say, well, that's not the same as reading the Bible with the leather. Read the, it's, the, it's the Word of God. Whether it's on a computer or, 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 or back with leather, it's the Word of God. Get the Bible app, and while you're driving to work, turn it on. And by the way, it's got a little thing with a little arrow that you push on it, and it starts talking to you. I don't like to read. Then push play, and there's a little English man that will speak the Bible to you. Scripture. How do we discover God's will? Number one, God's word. Number two, godly counsel. It's very important that you understand the word godly is in front of the counsel. It's not just counsel, it's godly counsel. Proverbs 11 and verse 14, For the lack of guidance, a nation falls, but victory is won through many advisors, many counselors. Next verse. Proverbs 24 and verse 6, Surely you need guidance to wage war, and victory is won through many advisors. Victory is won through many counselors. Godly counsel. Not just counsel, but godly counsel. I encourage people here all the time. I, I, I encourage people in our church. If you're having marriage issues, if you're just having little bumps in the road, hey, every marriage needs a tune-up from time to time. Whether it's a marriage conference you go to, you sign up to go to, or you want to go see a, a counselor, a Christian counselor, I'll give you that name. I had somebody come in the early service say, give me that name. I, I give that name out almost every week. Our Christian counselor who does a lot of Christian counseling for us. But it's important. That you go to a Christian, you know why? I, because there's a lot of counselors out here. A lot of people have doctors in front or behind their name that are in the counseling business, but they don't have a biblical worldview. They may not even believe in God. It's just you by yourself, and they may give you advice that doesn't have anything to do with the Word of God. Be careful who you go to. Go to a biblical counselor. Go to a Christian counselor. Godly counsel. Godly counsel. Listen to me, friend. You need to... You need to get somewhere in your life, then you need to go to someone and ask them who's already been where you're trying to go. When we were trying to figure out which service, how many, where to put another th a service, we looked at Saturday night, we looked at Sunday night, we looked at Thursday night, we looked at Wednesday night, we looked at everywhere in the world, we looked at another Sunday morning like we ended up doing. I called everybody I know that's already doing it. Don't do this night. I did it. It was a flop. Don't do that night. Don't do, don't do it. We learned from Sunday night. We did Sunday night at the Star Center, and everybody done got home and got their belly full and taking a nap and watching the Dallas Cowboys lose, and they did not want to get back up and come back to church on Sunday night. Are you laughing over the Dallas Cowboy thing or the belly? Okay, I figured that. You pulling for Joe Burrow. All right, so... Where was I? Hmm? Godly counsel. 
So I asked somebody that's already been there. So I asked everybody I knew, hey, what, what is the best? And so we ended up going with another Sunday morning because most people really like to go to church if they're going to go on a Sunday morning. So we just cram as many as we can and just get tired and wore out. And I just know I got to do some extra cardio because I'm fat. But we're going to get through it. And if we got to go to four services two weeks, two months, a year from now, we're going to go to four services. But we got to, you got to ask the right people the right questions, the right people the right. If you're a young married couple and you really want your marriage to thrive and not just survive, you don't want to be a statistic. Man, you want your marriage to be, you want 30 years from now just to be in love with your wife as much as you are. 40 years, 50 years, 60 years down, you want to be growing old together. You know, you want to be like that movie. The Notebook. You want to be laying in bed together at the nursing home. You know what I'm talking about? You want, a, you want that kind of love story. Don't, listen, don't go and ask somebody who's on their seventh marriage how to have a successful marriage. Find somebody that's been successful. Now, listen, if you're on your seventh marriage, you're, in the exact, you're, you're exactly where you need to be today. There's hope. Apply these principles that we're talking about today. All right. Well, godly counsel. Number three, God, uh, number three, God's peace. God will give you peace. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule, rule in your hearts. That word rule is an important word. That word rule means to govern or to give you direction. God will give you peace. As you're obeying God and you're pursuing God and you're living for Jesus to the very best of your ability, then God will give you the peace that you need as you head in a certain direction. But understand there's man's peace and there's God's peace. Man's peace... Uh, <laughs> I've had people come to me and say, hey, Pastor, well, you know, I've got a peace about it. And I know the situation. I'm like, sure. <laughs> I've got a peace about it, Pastor. Well, it, what they're saying is I've got a peace about being out of the disruption. I've got a peace about being out of the chaos. I've got a peace about being out of the relationship. Or I've got a peace about being away from the conflict. And I understand what they're saying. But there's a difference between man's peace and God's peace. God's peace, God's peace never compromises his word. God will give you peace through what you're going through. And then God uses sermons. Write that down. God uses sermons. John 137, the Bible says. John 137, when the two disciples heard him say this, heard who? Heard John the Baptist. The forerunner of Jesus heard him say this. They followed Jesus. What did John the Baptist say? Well, John the Baptist is out hanging, hanging around, eating locusts and whatever he did back in the day, you know, um, barley green or whatever he was doing. He was eating. He was hanging out. There goes Jesus. Oh, Jesus, the Lamb of God. When he said that, his disciples, John the Baptist's disciples says, oh, there's Jesus. And they left John the Baptist and they went and followed after Jesus. God uses men who stand and proclaim and preach Jesus. I want to tell you something today. A lot of thought and prayer go into preparing messages. I don't throw these together lightly. And this message today is for somebody in this room. It's for somebody that needs to know God's direction for their life. And I'm simply saying this. I'm not saying this because it's me. Anybody standing proclaiming the word of God. I'm saying this to you to understand that God is using this message today to touch your heart, to change your life. God uses sermons, but also God uses circumstances. Circumstances. Romans 8.28, you know the verse. And we know that, all, that in all things God works for good of those who love God and who have been called according to his purpose. He didn't say everything's good that happens in your life, but everything works for the good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Listen, we, we've got to learn to read our circumstances. Now, now get this. We've got to learn to read our circumstances. What do you mean? Ladies, look at me. Look at me. I'm going to get your attention in a second. If you've been dating the same dude... For 14 years, and you're waiting on that proposal any day now, 
It ain't happening. If you've been, if you've been dating 14 years, I, I just have to say this. He ain't all into you. God's got something better out there for you. Are you willing to settle or do you want the very best God has for you? I'm saying we got to learn to read the circumstances that come our way. Number next. I don't know what the next one is. Eight abilities. Abilities. God uses abilities. 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 20. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested, attested as a prophet of the Lord. That word attested literally means provide or serve as a clear evidence of or clarify or declared to be correct. In other words, in other words, they looked at Samuel, people outside of Samuel's life, and they looked at him, and they knew. They knew there was something different about him. They knew because of his abilities and his giftings that God was going to use him as a prophet of the Lord. Oftentimes, people see your gifts and your abilities in you before you ever even see them in yourself. And everybody in this place is gifted. If you're a child of God, you've got a gift. You are a gifted child of God. I want you to say this with me. I, come on, I am gifted. That's not arrogance. That's truth. Every child of God has at least one spiritual gift. And many of you have more than one. And we also have different abilities. Now, some of you guys can work with your hands like crazy. Some of you are just really, really intelligent. You work with your mind. Some of you, some of us, don't work with either. Amen? I mean, but we have other gifts and we have other abilities. Somewhere we're persistent. Amen? We're passionate. But, but we have certain abilities. Do what you're good at. I'll, people often say, well, I feel like God's calling me to the worship team. I'm like, I heard you sing last week. You sound like a dying mule in a hailstorm. God ain't calling you. I don't say that to them, but I say that out loud so if you come to me, you'll know I'm thinking about it. God uses our ability. We're all gifted in different ways. But also, he also gives us the desires of our hearts. Desires, desires. Psalm 37 and verse 4. Take delight. I love that word delight. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. How do we discover God's will? God will give us the desires of our heart. What does that word delight mean? That word delight means to pursue him over and above any person, thing, thought, or action in our lives. If we are, watch this, if we're pursuing God with everything in us, our pursuit is God. Our pursuit is our relationship with him. Our pursuit is honoring him. Our pursuit is giving him glory. If our pursuit is God first and foremost, Foremost, he's saying, this is what he's saying. He's saying, look, if that's your pursuit, I'm going to give you desires. And the desires that you have are there because they're my desires for you. What, is, what do you desire? What do you want? What keeps you up at night? Come on, child of God, what is it that drives you? What is it that wakes you up? What is it you wake up, you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning thinking about? I'm talking about a bologna sandwich. Guys, I'm not talking about sugar. What is, what is it? What is it that's deep in your heart that you have a, such a burning desire to do? I can't wait to cast vision. I can't wait to lead. I love to preach the word of God. This is what God, this is what God, I'm, I'm not in God's permissive. I've been in God's permissive will. I'm in God's perfect will for my life. I can stand on this platform. I can be real. I can be raw. I can be relevant. I can be myself. I don't have to pretend like I'm somebody else. I don't have to wear a suit and a tie and pretend like I like it. I can be me. I am in God's perfect will for my life. And this is the desire of my heart. I can't wait to do what we do every weekend. God wants you also to be in his perfect will. And he gives you the desires of your heart. Let me, let me give you one more. 
Number eight, the Holy Spirit. What do you mean? Acts 16 and verse 7, when they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithany, but the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them in. In other words, God shut a door and opened another one. I'm talking about open and closed doors. We love us some open doors, but we don't like closed doors. Oh, there's a door open. Yeah, woo! I'm running through that, baby. I like some open doors, but when God shuts a door in our lives, some for some reason we don't like it. But God, why? And then we start arguing with God, like we're smarter than God, like we know more than God. If He's our Savior, and we're His followers. He's sovereign. We're not. He's all-knowing and all-powerful. We're not. We have to trust him. It's hard, isn't it, sometimes? But God will close doors and God will open doors. God closed it. For example, God closed the door at Northside High School. We thought we were going to be at Northside High School until we built our building. We, we thought that's where we were going to be. We didn't think we were going to make another move. I didn't want to make another move because every time you move as a... As a church plant, that's what we're considered, considered a church plant until you're over 10 years of age. As a church plant, every time until you get into a permanent facility, every time you move from temporary location to temporary location, you lose 3% of your people. I don't know why. There's really no explanation for it. People just don't move from one place to another. 3%, you lose it. We did that from the Star Center to Northside. We lost 3%. I didn't want to go through that again. I didn't want to lose anybody. I want to, I'm like, I'm in the business of gaining people, amen? We're, we're trying to reach 5,000 worshipers by 2025, so we're not, we're not about to lose. We didn't want to move again, but God shut that door. Let me tell you something, friend. If you're a child of God and you're actively, watch this, you're pursuing God. You're pursuing God. If God shuts a door, he's only shutting a door so that he can open up another one. So God shut the door north side because of the pandemic. But then God opened up another door. Yes, it's a smaller facility, but hey, we can go to one, two, three services, four, five, six, whatever we got to do, and we don't have to set up or tear down anymore. So God closes doors, but then God opens doors in our lives. Thank God for that. Let me, let me close with this because I want to add one more. It's not on the screen, but I want to add one more. I want to add the word obedience. I want you to jot that word down, obedience. Walking in God's will requires obedience. Now listen to me, we're, we're almost done. Walking in God's will requires obedience. For example, Abraham. We talked about Abraham a couple of weeks ago. But Abraham was told by God to take his son Isaac, you know, the son that they waited forever to have. And finally God, God came through, you know, after they done made some bad decisions and went out and had, and did all his mother, his mother anyway, another stuff. Yeah. God said, I want you to take Isaac, your son, your only, your only bio, your, your son, your son with, with your, your wife Sarah, the the one that, that the promise of God is landing him on. I want you to take him and bring him to the mountain, and I want you to sacrifice him as, on the altar. I'm like, what? Yeah, and so Abraham was obedient to God, and then when he got on top of the mountain, there was a, and can you imagine, Isaac's like, hey, Dad. Yeah, what are we doing up here? Hey, Dad. Dad, I don't see no sacrifice. His dad's making an altar and starting a fire. Hey, Dad, where's the ram? And all of a sudden, over in the thicket, there's a ram. God supplied a sacrifice. But it took Abraham to be obedient to God first. After the obedience came the blessing. So we got to be obedient to God. And then you go to Moses in the Old Testament. You got Moses, and Moses is standing there, and he, he delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, and they're standing at the Red Sea. And, and God said, Moses, hold your hand up with the rod of God. Hold your hand up with the rod of God. But uh, Okay. Hold your hand up with the rod of God. Hold it up. And he see, held it up high. The waters parted, and the children of Israel walked across on dry ground. 
but he was a, had to be obedient first before the blessing and the favor and the miracle. You see what I'm saying? And then if you look at Peter in, I think it's Matthew chapter 17, interesting story. You've probably never heard many preachers preach on this, but Peter in Matthew 17, towards the end of the chapter, um, they're just hanging out, and one of the tax collectors said, hey, does Jesus not believe in paying taxes? And Peter's like, I don't know, Jesus, do you believe in paying taxes? He said, I tell you what, Peter, go down here to, to the water, put your hook in the water. Put your, catch a fish. When you catch, The very first fish you catch, look in his mouth, there's a coin in there. Take the coin and pay it to the tax collector. What? <laughs> I mean, that's a weird, that's kind of weird, isn't it? Go put your hook in the water, catch a fish, you'll find a coin in his mouth. Peter had to be obedient to God before the blessings and the favor and the miracle happened. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, God says, give tithe, give an offering to the storehouse. And he said, then I'll open up the windows of heaven and bless your socks off. He says, give first, obey me first. But here's the problem. We want windows before we want obedience. We, we want the windows of God to open and bless our socks off. Hey, God, if you'll bless me big, then I'll give you a little change. Cha-ching, cha-ching. God says, how about you obey me and give your tithe to the local storehouse, which is the local church, then sit back and watch me open the windows of heaven and bless your socks off. See, we've got to be obedient first, and then the miracles and the blessings and the favor come. How many of you want to be in God's will? Come on, say amen. amen. Come on, how many of you really want the best for your life? Say amen. amen. Come on, how many of you really want to be in the will of God? Say amen. amen. God wants his very best for you. Let me close with this. What's God's will? Madison, come on up here if you don't mind. What's God's will? What's God's will? Well, if you're a Christ follower today and you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, God's will, I want you to get this. Not, God's will is not as much about Tomorrow as it is about today. God's will is not as much about the future as it is about the present. You see, we make knowing the will of God very difficult. Let me share this verse with you just real quick. Proverbs 3, 6. It's my life verse. It's, it's in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. I want to build an invisible wall. An invisible wall right down the very center of this worship area, okay? If you see it, nod your head. It's invisible. You can't see it if it's invisible. All right, I knew I'd get you on that. But we're going to pretend there's an invisible wall right down the very center of this worship area. And I want to do something. I want to separate this verse. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. On this side, on this side, somebody say this side. On this side of the invisible wall, I want to put the first six words of the verse. In all your ways acknowledge him. And on this side of the wall, I want to put the other six words and he will direct your paths. Are you ready? Follow me now. On this side of the wall, in all your ways acknowledge him. On this side of the wall, and he will direct your paths. Now follow me. On this side, in all your ways, our ways acknowledge him. Whose side does this belong to? This is our side. In all our ways acknowledge him. And he, who's he? God, and he will direct. Whose side is this? It's God's side. So that side's our side. This side is God's side. What's our responsibility? In all our ways, acknowledge Him. And He will direct our... It's not our job to direct our past. It's not our job to figure out what's going to be happening 20 years down the road. It's not our job to know what's happening tomorrow afternoon. Our job is simply, in all our ways, in the present moment, to acknowledge God. But here's the problem. Because sometimes we think we know more than God. Sometimes we have this idea that we're going to run our own lives. So we get off of our side of the wall. Watch this, watch this. We get off of our side of the wall. You ready? And we get on God's side of the wall. We get off our side and we get on God's side of the wall. And we try to direct our own paths. And every time we do this, we mess it up. Why? Because we're on the wrong side. 
God didn't call you to direct your past. God called you to acknowledge him. Child of God, God called you to acknowledge him and let him open doors and close doors. God called you to acknowledge him. God called you, watch this, to walk in the light, not in the darkness. God called you to grow your own walk with God by being obedient to the things of God. God called you to acknowledge him in your Bible study, in your prayer life, in your church, faithful church attendance. God called you to acknowledge him in your, in your generosity, in your giving, in your tithing. God called you to acknowledge him in your, in your, uh, your, your faith living and, and, and sharing your faith with other people that are lost without Christ. God called you to acknowledge him. And God says, listen, if you'll just do what I tell you to do, don't you worry about this. I got you. I got you. And God will have us. And God will bless us and God will open doors that we will, it will blow our minds. We need to get off of our God's side and get back on our side. What's God's will for our life? To live for Him and acknowledge Him today. Not to worry about tomorrow. Trust God today and let Him direct our paths. Now, you're here today and you're not a Christ follower. There's never been a time and a place in your life where you ask Jesus to save you. What's, what's this have to do with me? What's God's will for my life? Does He have a will for me? I'm not a Christian. Is there a will for me? Yeah. 2 Peter 3 9, the Bible says, the Bible says, uh, what does it say? God is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that it, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I'm here today, Pastor, and I I'm not a Christ follower. I've never been saved. I, I've never been. I've, I've never experienced the light of God. I'm not a Christian. I'm just kind of figure, trying to figure all this out. Does God have a will for my life? Yeah. He wants you to be saved. His will is for you to repent of your sins and come to Him. That's His will. That's His will. He doesn't want you to perish. That word perish literally means go to hell. He doesn't want you to go to hell. God didn't create hell for you and I. He created hell for the devil and his angels. He doesn't want you and I to go to hell. He, wants, he, he came and, and gave us a way out. He let his son Jesus die on the cross for our sins. But he wants you to repent. What's the word repent mean? It means a change of mind that leads to a change of action. Now you can't save yourself, but you have to come to the place where you have a change of mind about your own life. You see, we think we can fill this God-shaped void up that we have with all kinds of stuff in the world. Drugs and alcohol and relationships and things and money and fame and, and likes on social media. If we can just, you know, I'm just going to, none of that stuff fulfills you. None of that stuff will give you peace. None of that stuff will give you joy. The only thing that will give you peace and joy and fulfillment in life is if you fill the God-shaped void with God. With God. And so you got to change your thinking. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of action. So here you are. You're walking in darkness and you're walking further in darkness. And, 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 and you come to church one day and you hear this message that God has a, a plan and a purpose and a will for your life. And you're like, okay, wow. You mean there's something else out there besides what I'm trying? Yes. And he's saying, listen, you got a about face. Turn your back on your old life, on the darkness, and turn towards Jesus. You can't save yourself, but you can turn your back on your old life. Turn your life to Jesus, the one that can save you, the one that can change you, the one that can give you peace and contentment that this world can't give you. Today, some of you are here for this very moment, for such a time as this ladies and gentlemen redeem the times because the days we live in are evil this is your opportunity to change your thinking to repent of your sins and turn towards God today you can give your heart and life to Jesus and know that's God's will for your life and then God doesn't stop there but God's got other stuff in store for you 
good stuff. Amen? Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Matter of fact, if you've never given your life to Jesus today, we want to give you a chance to do that. We've had three or four young ladies in their 20s give their life to Christ this morning. We've had a 77-year-old lady so excited to give her life to Jesus today. And today could be the greatest day of your life. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes.